Tonight we have with us Dr. Liz Johnson from JMU. She did her undergrad at Rice, and uh, her graduate and her PhD work was at Caltech. She did a year at the Smithsonian, which I think is crazy cool. And she has one of the best reasons I've ever heard for going into her field. I asked what it was about geology. She goes, I like rocks and dirt. <laughs> and that's about, about the coolest I could go with. So would you please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Johnson. today and this is an example of one of these volcanoes that is now extinct so we don't have to worry about having like the volcano movie where things are erupting in Los Angeles anymore uh, but this I'm from James Madison University in the Shenandoah Valley and this is JMU's campus including the old stadium here it's now much taller and then if you look towards the west over Harrisonburg and the campus of the university there are the big mountains in the back, which are the Allegheny Mountains and West Virginia and Western Virginia. And then there's this lump here, which is the eroded root or kind of insides of an ancient volcano. Um, and so this is one example. This one is called Mole Hill. It's bigger than a normal mole hill that you would find in your backyard from a real mole. But I guess it kind of has the same shape or something like that. I don't know why they called it that. So that's one of these little things I'm going to be talking about. You can kind of see um, in the background houses and trees and stuff for scale, to give you an idea of the size of this. So, um, Before I keep going, I'd like to thank some people, including the Jeffress Foundation, uh, which funds research in Virginia and has funded my project for more than two years. Um, also, the National Science Foundation and Department of Defense have been associated with a research experience program for undergraduates over the summer at James Madison University, their material science research. And so uh, we have students working on research projects over the summer through that program. Um, also, NSF has, you'll see, I'm taking slides from this workshop that I went to where a bunch of really smart people got together to think about what was going on on the east coast of the United States in terms of geology. Um, my students, there's three of my students who are working on their projects, um, don't just work at James Madison University. These two are up at the U United States Geological Survey in Reston doing some analytical work and measuring the chemistry of the rocks. And this guy down here um, is also using a piece of equipment. It's uh, basically a microscope that you can look at tiny slices of rock to see features close up. And so we'll look at at least a sample that we prepared these thin sections of rocks from. And that's what he's doing. Okay. But the undergraduate students, James Madison is an undergraduate only institution. There's no graduate students. And all of our geology majors, there's 130 or more of them now, have to do a research project to graduate. And so these are the students I've had or have started projects on this line of work over the past year or so. Um, and it's, you know, they have great ideas and we do great work um, even though we're not graduate students. Um, and finally, again, thanks again for inviting me. Um, it's always interesting to come someplace completely new and see all the cool facilities here and give a talk to people you've never met before. <laughs> All right, so um, in particular, what I'm going to talk about today, um, I have to, I don't know, spoiler alert, I don't, uh, there are other volcanic eruptions in Virginia besides the ones I'm going to talk about today, but I'm going to talk about the ones that happened most recently in the past. And what I'm showing here in this diagram, very up in the top here is the state of Virginia, so we're down here right now. And this little box is showing this part of the map blown up really big. And you can see that I live on the other side of the state. So James Madison is up here in this little box. And here we are blown up on this part of the diagram. There's Harrisonburg. 
There is Mole Hill, the one that I showed you on that first slide. And there's a whole bunch of other little volcanic bodies that are out here, arguably, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, has anybody ever been to Highland County? A few people. Um, what's there to do in Highland County? Maple syrup. They have maple syrup. Um, and kind of wandering around in the mountains. There's not very many people out there. Um, okay. And these things are small. They can be hard to find at times. They're in private land, so they're not easily accessible, all of them anyway. Um, and so I'm going to try to convince you that it's still really interesting that we should go and find them and study them. Um, these eruptions happened in a time period, a, a, a geologic epoch called the Eocene, and that was approximately 54 to about 38 million years ago. And at that point, I mean, so maybe you're saying, oh my, 38 million years ago, why do I care about this? Well, guess what? In the geologic time scale, that's practically today for what we're talking about, especially in terms of Virginia's geologic history. Um, if I had a piece of paper, sort of like, um, uh, the paper you get at a cash register, a long roll of paper, I guess maybe toilet paper too. <laughs> if I took that and kind of threw it up the staircase and had it kind of from one end to the other end of this room, I bet I mean, we get close to something like 45 and a half feet of toilet paper, say. And if that we had that represent all of geologic time, okay, the Eocene would represent the distance between me and six inches away from me, compared to the distance between me and the beginning of geologic time, which would be like the back of the room. And so it really is, even though it seems like forever and ever, millions of years to us as humans, geologically speaking, geologists look at this and say, wow, that was not very far in the past. And that's one of the really interesting things is that most of Virginia's geologic history happened well before the Eocene. And these things are kind of special because they happened much more recently, geologically speaking. Not in terms of our lives, but geologically speaking. Okay, so I'm a geologist, so I like to show people maps. Um, so this, this picture here it looks like Virginia. It is, in fact, a map of Virginia. It's got stripes of different colors on it, and each different color represents a particular kind of rock or kind of a group of rocks. And so somebody, a lot of people did a lot of work to kind of make this map of the important geologic units of Virginia. And they've subdivided this um, into different sort of subsections. And the easiest way to look at this is to take my trip, my road trip from where I live to Newport News. And so again, I live all the way up here and I'm in this kind of area, which is the Valley and Ridge province of Virginia. And I don't, I don't quite make it into the Appalachian Plateau. That's all this stuff kind of in the tail of Virginia and then right beyond in West, West Virginia for us is where the Appalachian Plateau starts. So I actually started the Valley and Ridge and it's just what it sounds like. It's a series of valleys and ridges, long skinny valleys kind of oriented this way that are separated by mountain ridges over and over and over again. It's because the Earth's crust got crinkled in a mountain building event long ago. Um, and so I start there and I drive over those ridges and stuff and then I hit the Blue Ridge, which is this next province here. Okay, and so by the time I have to go over a big mountain, Shenandoah National Park and get over that, and I'm in Charlottesville, and then the next kind of area here is the Piedmont, so I kind of drive over the hill, little hills and valleys into Richmond, and then by the time I get down here, we're in the coastal plain, it's pretty flat. Right? And so the elevation changes and characteristic of the landscape in Virginia is actually really controlled in a lot of ways by the underlying rocks in those different regions. Um, and the bottom line here, again, is that the, there's some sediments, or what I, you know, dirt stuff, um, out in the coastal plain that's covering older rocks out here, where you guys are. Um, 
but most of these rocks from Virginia are very old, and the oldest ones are more than one billion years old. And most of these, by 300 million years ago, most of them are already formed. There's a couple here and there, little areas, um, kind of valleys filled in that have younger stuff, like 200 million years or so. Okay, but the point of this is basically, by 300 million years ago, you've already got most of Virginia's rocks formed. And now we're thinking on geologic time scale, because all of a sudden, 35 to 50 million years doesn't sound so long ago. Okay? Most of this already happened. Okay. So, remember, part of this is I'm trying to explain to you why these volcanoes are particularly interesting. And what I want to do is show you this animation that we could probably look at over and over again all day, but we're not going to. And it's going to show you how the Earth's continents, as part of these plate, uh, tectonic plates, have moved around the Earth's surface through geologic time. And there's some really cool, funky stuff that goes on um, on there. They also show glaciers coming in and out through geologic time. But most of what we want to look at is the last 200 million years of the animation where this big, big continent called Pangaea splits apart. And it's from 200 million years ago to today that we're really interested in looking at. And this is from a textbook, so I did not make this myself, um, but I use it in my classes sometimes. Yeah, so if you, it's the Smith and Poon uh, Introductory Geology Textbook. Okay, that's all I want to say about that. And then uh, we're going to go from 600 million years ago. Now remember, this is somebody's interpretation of a bunch of geologic evidence, so it's kind of guidelines as to what probably happens. Go for it. And we started 600 million years ago. Keep going. And I'll show you, here's North America. 600 million years ago. This is the South Pole. This is the North Pole. The equator goes through here. Virginia is somewhere down here. And you can see 540 million years ago, Virginia is splitting off of a big continent, and we're in the southern hemisphere. Keep going. 200 million years ago. And it kind of looks, it's a very weird shape, but you basically got one giant supercontinent on Earth. And this is what's called Pangaea. Okay. And Yet, right at 200 million years ago, you can see, here's Virginia right here, and we've got basically a new plate boundary forming, and this is going to go that way, and this is going to go that way, and we're going to split and form the North Atlantic Ocean. This chunk right here that we're splitting from is going to become Africa. And in fact, after this was all swooshed together, and then this pulls apart, we think that part of Africa got left here, and we're probably standing on part of it right now. Um, it's pretty cool to think about that this piece might have belonged to another continent on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean now. Um, okay, so let's keep going. We're going to see, pretty soon here, it's going to start looking almost like you could kind of recognize stuff. So by about 100 million years ago, when dinosaurs were wandering around, Okay, we've started at least forming what looks like um, uh, a mini Atlantic Ocean here. Africa is spread away from us, and we're right here. Okay, let's keep going. And so you can see that the Atlantic Ocean is opening up here, and there's a boundary at the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that's basically erupting volcanoes and pushing those plates apart from each other. And that's what's going on. So he stopped it at about 50 million years ago because 50 million years ago is when these first volcanic eruptions started happening, um, the ones that I'm going to talk about in Virginia. You can see we're all the way over here, and yet the boundary between these two plates where these things are moving apart is actually lying in the middle of this new Atlantic Ocean. So we're not anywhere near that plate boundary, which is where you'd expect volcanoes to happen. Okay, so let's if we can finish 20 million years, and then they, they stop at the last glacial maximum, which has very little to do with what I'm talking about, but that's the last time we had the most glaciers, um, and then we can, and they continue to today, 
think it just, yeah, that it just shows ice change. So there's been really no motion of the plates that are that huge amount of uh, motion over just 21,000 years. So um, again, that's the Earth's history from about 600 million years ago. Um, but the basic point here for us is that starting 200 million years ago, this big continent split apart and then you know, by the time these volcanoes were erupting in Virginia, we weren't anywhere close to where the plate boundary was anymore. So with that in mind, okay, there were other volcanoes that have happened in Virginia's past. Just full disclosure, um, there were ones 540 million years ago, and now the eruptions, the rocks that were erupted lie on top of Skyline Drive, and if you ever go hiking in Shenandoah National Park, a lot of the gray, spiky looking rocks used to be giant lava flows um, before they got shoved on top of that mountain. Um, these rocks here, okay, if you look at this diagram, here's the United States, here's the coastline of Virginia, and you go up to you know, New England, and this is where Africa was, relatively speaking, okay, 200 million years ago before the Atlantic Ocean formed. And same thing, South America was squished all up here, and they all fit together kind of like this in one big continent. And these red and pink uh, lines and areas represent volcanic eruptions that happened about 200 million years ago. And it makes sense, because if you're ripping a continent apart to form a new ocean basin, the way that you form the ocean basin is by erupting new volcanic material that hardens into rocks, a rock called a basalt, and that forms the ocean floor. And now, it, people still think it's a little weird that you get it like all over the place, not even really at the boundary where they split apart, but even farther inland. But there's good evidence. This is all people have collected these samples and figured out how old they are, and they exist, and they're from about 200 million years ago. And geologists like to name everything really complicated names and use acronyms that nobody else understands. So they call these the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, and they abbreviated this camp, because that's what happens. Um, that's what they do. <laughs> I do it too. There are actually other eruptions that happened after 200 million years ago, after those two continents started splitting apart. Um, and most of them, though, had happened by 100 million years ago. And now, here's Virginia down here, here's the coastline where you guys are, and most of those that happened between 200 and 100 million years ago were kind of concentrated in the ocean as little tiny eruptions or seamounts. Um, and there are a few things here and there, including a few things in western Virginia, but most of them um, were out in the ocean too, and there weren't very many of them. So, kind of to summarize here, this is as if I took a slice through the Atlantic Ocean. And we're in Virginia here, and there's Africa. And when Pangaea broke up, it's very sad, um, but Virginia moved one way, Africa went the other way, and by breaking that up, you formed an ocean basin in between that became the Atlantic Ocean eventually. And so what it's showing is sort of a time progression. This last slice, basically shows the picture of what was going on during the Eocene, 56 to 34 million years ago, and it's basically also showing what's going on today. There are based, uh, volcanic eruptions happening in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean along this um, mountain ridge, the mid-ocean ridge, and you form new ocean crust, and you form new parts of the plates, and that pushes Virginia away from Africa. This is the plate boundary right here. And it's where you expect volcanoes to erupt, according to our understanding of plate tectonics. That happens. The problem is, with these Eocene volcanoes, is that they erupted over here. And that's kind of weird, because plate tectonics doesn't explain why that would happen at all. Um, doesn't predict that. Okay, so now, this is why this is really interesting. These happen basically on geologic time scale right now. Um, 
And they happened after all the Virginia geologic history had almost happened, um, basically. And it's happening, these things are erupting in Western Virginia and West Virginia at a time when we're far, far away from the plate boundary and you don't expect volcanic eruptions to happen here. And that's why, one of the reasons why this is really interesting. The name for a continental, the edge of a continent that's not anywhere near a plate boundary is called a passive margin because you're not supposed to have anything happen. It's just supposed to lie there passively. Um, the coast is just sitting here doing nothing because it's not on the plate boundary. So you don't expect the plate to be moving where we are in Virginia. It's just sleeping, basically. There no, shouldn't be any earthquakes. There shouldn't be any volcanic eruptions. There shouldn't be any signs that the crust is moving by itself up or down or any other direction here um, any differently than you know if it was just part of this giant North American continent. Um, and that's, we, geologically, we call that a passive margin. It's not doing anything. It's not part of a plate boundary. Okay? But okay, the joke with Eastern North America is that we, and this was, the first time I heard this was last fall, was that um, they call this a passive-aggressive margin, meaning, and if you know the psychology behind that, I don't think it really means, we're not trying to say that it means exactly what it means for human behavior, but the, the joke is that, not that the, the east coast of the United States is like out to get you by trying to manipulate you or anything like that, but that there actually is stuff going on in the East Coast of the United States, and uh, even and maybe especially in Virginia. Um, and so, remember, Eocene is basically like today, geologically speaking. There are these mysterious volcanic eruptions um, out <coughs> in an area where there shouldn't be any volcanic eruptions. Um, if you ever drive west <laughs> into the western part of Virginia, you will notice that you have to go up, not, not just up and down mountains, but especially in places, there's basically sort of a giant cliff. Okay? And so there's this little gray line I'm pointing to here that's a change in elevation that you can especially see in southwestern Virginia. It's called the Blue Ridge Escarpment. And literally everything is kind of being pushed, it seems like everything's being pushed upwards um, for no particular reason and that the crust is kind of swelling upwards, and we have geologic evidence for that, and it causes that cliff to form and then move through geologic time as the rocks fall down and get eroded away. Right? So that there's evidence that there's some, something going on under there to make the mountains and everything else kind of lift up more than they should. And then, who felt the earthquake? Whoa, so people felt it here? That's cool. And I wonder if it felt differently, because I felt it too. Um, but I was all the way on the other side of Virginia, um, on the other side of the mountains. And I, I don't know, I think it's amazing that the seismic waves on the east coast can travel so far through this really um, hard rock material that we have over here. Um, so we know that there's not just that earthquake. That's the earthquake that happened last summer is this big red star. Um, but this is also plotting all these points here, are plotting other earth, uh, earthquakes that happened along the East Coast. I don't know how they, they must have just kind of looked at historical records back to 1627. This isn't my diagram either, I borrowed it. But you can see that they're all over the place, and there's certain areas that, where they seem to kind of cluster, as far as we can tell, including this whole line across central Virginia. Um, and so I wouldn't say that this is a completely passive margin at all. I'd say, I don't you know, passive-aggressive is kind of a joking term, but there's definitely stuff going on here even though we're not at a plate boundary. Um, and there's many different kinds of things going on, and we really want to be able to understand this better um, because it's something that people still don't understand very well. So that's one of the, I went to a meeting in October where they had a whole bunch of scientists finally kind of coming together and thinking about this, wow, we don't really understand what's going on um, in Eastern North America. It's worth thinking about. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to take all these seismometers that measure earthquakes 
and they've been moving them from the west coast of the United States that has lots of earthquakes, they've been moving them across the country and they're going to get here next year. And they're going to put them all up and down the east coast to study what's going on in the east coast a lot better. So this is not, you know, it's not like we understand everything about what's going on here, which is one of the reasons why it's really interesting. And so you could ask a lot of different questions based on these volcanic rocks. And I'm going to propose three kind of groups of questions, and we'll see how far we get. Um, I'll try to talk a little bit about this one. Um, we may skip that one if we don't have time. And I don't know what the answer is to the last one, but might as well kind of show you a cool picture. Um, but there's many questions like, actually, these volcanic rocks can tell us what is underneath the surface of Virginia. And again, this is something that you think everybody knew the end of everything, everything about it, but we don't because we don't have a lot of scientific evidence yet. Um, you usually get that kind of evidence from seismometers and rock samples, and we have very little of that data right now. Okay, so we want to look at rocks and other things to try to see what are the layers look like underneath Virginia as you go deeper into the earth. Another interesting question is, well, these weird Eocene volcanic eruptions, what were they like? If you could witness them, what kind of eruptions were they? How did they happen? Um, and so, again, you can kind of look at the evidence. We go out and look at the rocks in the field. We look at the hand samples of rocks that we pick up and try to learn about what the eruptions were actually like. And then the last one, which is kind of the obvious question, is, well, you know, recent geologic uh, time, these things are happening and there's no explanation from plate tectonics. Why were things erupting in Virginia? And we, if no other reason, you want to understand that so you understand what's going on today, which is not that far from the Eocene, geologically speaking. Okay, so, um, I want to show everybody some of the things that you see as a geologist. So I'm going to present my evidence and my observations to you guys. And if that takes most of the rest of this, I'm okay with that because I think it's some of the more interesting stuff. The students really like it. We go out and explore and look for them. We have to find the rocks first, which can be no easy task sometimes. Uh, we have to figure out what they look like um, if we walk around, you know, what kind of volcanic body are we looking at, and then we have to find good samples to take and study in the lab. Okay, so this first picture, and most of the, the perspective on these pictures is kind of funky because uh, people are either looking up or down a, a, a steep hill. Um, so in this case, there's a student pointing their camera downhill at us, and that's, I'm crouching to look at the rocks, but also, also because I'm going to fall into this guy if I don't. Um, brace myself. It doesn't look as steep as it actually is there. Um, this is the side of Mole Hill. So that's the thing that I showed you in the title slide. And it's covered in trees, and in the summer it's covered in weeds um, up to here. And so, um, and now it's owned by somebody that you have to get permission to, to go up there. Because it's all, almost all this again is on private land. Um, but they've been very nice um, to let us up and do our classes up there. Um, you can kind of see, this is not a bad time, it must be mid-October according to the, the leaves, and there's leaves all over the place, but these gray things are rocks, and I'm going to show you some of the rocks in a second. And so at times, it's hard to see what's going on, but at times you can actually convince yourself that the whole side of the hill is mostly rock, and you're actually seeing the rocks almost in place. Okay? You saw on that title slide the shape of the hill was kind of this rounded lump. Right? What Mole Hill is, is it's again kind of the eroded stump of a volcano. And what they're showing in this diagram is the, the magma okay, coming from deep in the earth, the molten rock, would come up through this volcano and then would erupt at the surface here, and then it cooled and over geologic time, okay, so you have solid rock after it cooled from the magma, over geologic time the hill got eroded away until there's nothing left but kind of a stump. And then their picture, they're 
stump is sticking up a lot more than mole hill. It gets completely rounded off and it just looks like a stub. Um, and that's what you do. You walk up the hill and you've got the other rocks and then eventually it gets steeper and that's where you start getting the volcanic rocks exposed. Here's another one. This is in Highland County, and if you ever go look for maple syrup during the Maple Festival in March, uh, you can actually see this one from Monterey, the town. Um, it's practically in the town. Um, so here's our one of our bands, um, and here's again here are the other mountains not related to this, and this is another one of those little volcanic necks. And here I am again. The perspective you can see this is flat going down here, but somebody's braced themselves looking downhill that's kind of crooked. And this is a better, it's easier to see the exposure of rock. Okay, and these are all that rock that formed from uh, magma, the volcanic rocks there. And this is what Highland County looks like on a good day in the middle of March. Uh, not too much snow. I think they've already had, I don't know how many feet of snow this year. <laughs> There are other forms that the volcanic rocks take in the field as well. Um, and this is a funny name, I know, but um, at least we spell it in the American way, D-I-K-E-S. Um, the British, he's laughing over there, they don't spell it, they spell it D-Y-K-E-S. But what it means, geologically speaking, is magma came up through the ground along a big fracture so the magma would come from down here up there and it forms this kind of vertical plane as it pushes through to the surface of the earth. And again, our, our maybe we need to improve our photo taking abilities here, but this is almost as good as it gets in terms of exposure out there. This lump is one end of a dike and if you kind of follow the top of this ridge where the grass is, it kind of comes up like this and this is the dike kind of coming across the surface of the earth. So you're kind of looking at that part there. And I think if I click one more, yeah, I kind of outlined, that's the volcanic rock. All the other rocks are a different kind of rock that it came up through. So volcanic rock would be this stuff. And if you look at the end of this, which is cut by the road, okay, this is what it looks like. And these are some of the other students working on this project. Um, this is some of the typical volcanic rocks, and again, it's hard to tell unless you actually go up there and look at it in detail that you know what you've got, because they just kind of look like rocks in that picture. Um, there's some cooling fractures, uh, they're called columnar joints that actually happen here and down here. But again, if you didn't know what you were looking at, they just look at some, like some rocks. Okay? But that's, that's what a dike looks like. And then the last kind are basically like um, ice cream cone shaped or carrot shaped so that they would look like you stabbed an ice cream cone into the ground and filled it up with uh, Rocky Road ice cream or something like that from the bottom, kind of shot it up. Um, and these are called diatremes and they must have happened very fast, um, they must have been kind of like popping the top on your soda bottle after you shake it up. All these gases come out of the magma just like gases come out of your, uh, your Coke or whatever soda you have and make a violent eruption and you get soda everywhere. Well, this is kind of the same thing except it comes up through this uh, cone-shaped um, intrusion and kind of erupts all over the surface. And what you see, again, there's this tiny little blocks sometimes. This is, Sometimes all you'll see as exposure of one of these, not even five feet across, um, and if you look, you'll see that this, this is the volcanic rock, but it has chunks of other rock that it blew out of the crust as it was kind of blasting its way through to the surface. And again, um, I've got samples to show you guys, but these chunks can tell you about what was underneath, um, because they had to come from underneath. They were blasted out as the magma was traveling from deep down to the surface. So that's part of our scientific evidence that we're interested in. But these can look kind of like a mess, and they've just got chunks of all kinds of stuff in them. Now, some of our scientific evidence comes from the rock that cooled from the magma itself. 
And again, not all of these, but most of these, they're, they're volcanic rocks, and most of them are the kind of volcanic rock called a basalt. And here's one in, outside in the field. You can see there's all kinds of interesting things like hay, and this is a place where there's sheep everywhere, so there's probably sheep poo over here, and the yellow stuff is lichens, and there's probably more lichens over here. But for geologists, you cut, you bang on the rock, open it up, look at the inside, and that's what you're actually interested in for geologic problems most of the time. And the inside of the rock is a nice gray-black color, and if you take this rock and slice it up, slice a little piece of it, glue it to a, a glass slide, and cut like a deli slice of the rock and polish it, you can look at it through a microscope and see all the nice crystals and stuff that you can't see if you just hold the rock up as a hand sample. And so this picture here is showing the close-up. You can see this white bar is one millimeter across, which is teeny tiny, you know, like maybe a little more than uh, the distance across a, a thick ballpoint pen or something like that. So these tiny crystals here, okay, there's, this is a mineral called plagioclase. Here's a mineral called clinopyroxene. They're just names of minerals. And we can tell what they are, and we can see that this texture is completely consistent with this rock crystallizing from a magma. So the kind of crystals and the kind of flow textures, you can see how they're all lined up. Um, you can tell that it's actually forming from a magma. And then the other cool things, not only at Mole Hill, but those are the samples that I brought today, but all these other volcanic um, exposures as well, again, a lot of them blast chunks of the rocks that they're traveling through out of the ground and carry them up to the surface. So in this cartoon, the red stuff is the magma coming from a layer in the earth called the mantle. And as the magma starts rising, it might break off chunks of the mantle and then chunks of the next layer up called the crust. And these chunks okay, will get carried with that magma ascending to the surface and then the magma will cool in the volcano and you preserve those chunks from way deep down below um, the surface of the earth. And so these chunks are called, if it's a chunk of a rock, okay, xeno means foreign, um, they're called xenoliths. If it's just one mineral crystal, which kind of happens sometimes with the mantle rocks, they just break individual crystals off, then they're called xenocrysts, like foreign crystals. And these are really important, again, because they, you're basically sampling layers of the Earth um, and bringing them to the surface for geologists so we don't have to be like that movie, The Core, or whatever, and go down in spaceships and try to see what's down there. They bring them to the surface. It's a lot easier. So I'm going to hand around some of these rock samples um, for you guys to look at. And if you don't get a chance to see one or more of them, uh, hopefully they'll all end it back down here at the end so you can take a look. Um, most of them have a number of these different crystals in them. So even if you only see one, you probably actually, one rock, you probably see more than one of these crystals. Okay. The major kind of xenolith or foreign rock, at least at Mole Hill, is this, you know, it seems a little light in here, but I can show you the real rock. Okay. This one is kind of easy. It looks like it has like a pimple or a zit on it. And that little white thing, that's the sandstone. Okay? Sandstone is basically a rock that's made out of sand originally that solidified to form a rock. And it's mostly quartz sand. So you guys probably have seen the beach out here. Think about that solidifying being part of the Earth's crust. And it's somewhere down there and it got ripped out as this thing erupted and it's embedded and this rock, which is the basalt that brought it to the surface. Okay, so you can see that one. Um, maybe I'll start passing stuff right now. Everything else that you see in here, okay, most of it is a gray rock, which is the basalt, but there are other shiny things in there, and almost everything else are these xenocris, different minerals from the mantle, which is the next layer down. And it took a while to figure out that's where they came from. It can be a little tricky to figure out, but we looked at them under the microscope and did some chemical analyses, and that's where we think they come from. 
So if you're a mineral buff, you might recognize some of these names, but if not, it's okay. You can just see the shiny things. Um, this one is shiny and it kind of looks like an olive green, and that's the mineral olivine. And that's in this one that's kind of thin, that's been broken out. And if you can kind of see, you know, it looks like a, a, a beverage bottle color, if you will. Um, you might want to look at that one. There's other crystals in this one as well. Some of them are really big and black and shiny, and those are a mineral called clinopyroxene. And again, some of them I've circled, so the green stuff is just circling with a marker. It's not something that's part of the rock. So here's a couple of really big, shiny clinopyroxene crystals from deep down. And we have some other ones that are kind of hard to find. Um, this one I've only found two of. It's a mineral called feldspar. And another one that's kind of black, but it's not as shiny, it's kind of dull. Um, that's called a spinel. And those are very abundant, but they're really important. And so I'll pass them around. This thing is what we make the microscope sections out of to look at under the microscope. So it's a rock embedded in glue. And the black thing is a spinel. Um, in this rock that I'm passing around, there's a circle around the white thing, and that's the feldspar. Okay, and again, it took a while to figure out what these were, but it's really cool because we've sampled the crust and the mantle underneath the Shenandoah Valley, and in Virginia too, and just in general. Okay, so again, I'll talk maybe for a few minutes about this first question, and then probably, I'm going to skip the middle one and go to the end because I know that's probably what people want to think about. Okay, but we've seen these minerals, what can they tell us? This is our record of what happened in the geologic past. There was no one sitting around in the Eocene writing notes about what happened. This is our record, and we have to use the minerals that we see and the chemistry of those minerals to tell us what was going on under there. Okay. And so basically, we're looking at something like this, where Again, this is Virginia. Here's the ocean. So you guys, we're somewhere like here at the edge of the continent. Where I live is somewhere out here. And the magma is coming from this mantle layer. And it's blasting through the layers of the mantle and the crust. And we're sampling information about the mantle and the crust. And so I'll give you one example of this. Let's skip this one. Kind of complicated. Here's a big mineral. This is that black shiny mineral, clinopyroxene, and it's from the mantle. And we can take this and look at it under the microscope, but then we can actually take this crystal, it's about a centimeter across, um, and put it under that instrument at the U.S. Geological Survey and measure the composition. So literally we can shoot it with an electron gun and measure the composition of the mineral over and over again across this transect. Okay? And we get this right here is showing the amount of calcium that changes in the crystals we go across. And this is iron. And we can get a lot of other elements as well. Well, that's great. We can measure the composition. But somebody has figured out the chemical composition tells us how deep this mineral came from and what temperature it came from. And so there's a lot of like people experimenting and testing and calibrating uh, the chemistries. But the bottom line is we can calculate this. And what we come up with is that these minerals are recording at the deepest that they probably came from about 40 kilometers underneath the surface, which is kind of, that's pretty cool. Um, we know that some part of the mantle, that layer below the crust, is as shallow as about 40 kilometers underneath the Shenandoah Valley, based just on the chemistry of the minerals that we collected from those rocks. And this diagram is showing okay, the temperature and pressure depth. So you go down, you go deeper into the earth, and it gets more and more pressure because there's rock on top of you. And this is our data from those minerals. And it also fits into the field. We have the mineral spinel in our rocks, and that fits pr 
pretty well. That's what we expect um, for those depths. And so we've basically okay, said that the first piece of the mantle is down here. And in fact, it's about 40 kilometers from the, the surface. And it actually matches with geophysical data that people have gotten for Virginia. So we're on, we, we know something about underneath Virginia from these rocks based on that. And then the last thing, well, anybody see this? Uh, this was in the newspaper um, here sometime in the fall. Uh, this is probably not what these eruptions look like, um, giant magma flows. It's kind of a cool cover for a magazine. Um, but they were probably more like little tiny eruptions happening in the middle of a field somewhere that they actually experienced in Mexico in 1943. A guy was plowing a cornfield and the volcano started erupting right next to his feet. Um, they are probably sort of the small scale things is what actually they were like. So, kind of the punchline here, and this is where I put this last because <laughs> I don't think I know very much about this right now, and I think people from James Madison University who are probably going to work with people from Virginia Tech are going to try to understand a little bit better about what's going on. Um, why would we have volcanic eruptions? It's a very key question during the Eocene Why? Um, and yet, we don't, we kind of have an idea of maybe how to address this question, but we don't really know what the answer is yet. Um, Again, this animation is not mine, it comes from this fellow. Um, there are people who take lots of studies of earthquakes. Um, they detect them with seismometers and they make these giant computer models to basically um, simulate plate tectonics on the computer. Um, what this is showing here, okay, this is a map and here's the east coast. So again, they have the white dot almost exactly where we are standing right here. This black line is the slice that they're taking through North America and the Atlantic Ocean. And this is the slice, so imagine kind of cutting the Earth open along that slice and looking downwards. Um, and they're only showing since 30 million years ago, so they don't actually cover the time when the Virginia volcanoes were erupting. But one of the really interesting things here, I know it's all pretty colors and stuff, okay, here's the coast of Virginia, so here's going towards North America, and this is going towards the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the colors here, and they kind of, they're interpreted to mean hot and cold in the Earth's mantle, okay? And you can see this big, cold wedge coming underneath us, okay? If anybody wants to be creeped out by something, okay, this thing, we think, is the subducted, or part of um, uh, a plate that got pushed into the mantle, on the west coast of the United States starting about 80 million years ago. And it went down into the mantle, but it's, and it's sinking like a ship. Because it's cold and dense, it's sinking in the mantle, but it's still sinking. And they can think they can see it with the geophysical data that's kind of moving down. Again, we're right here, somehow 800 kilometers underneath us, there's a sinking ship, um, a subducting slab, and it's pulling that layer, the mantle, around and around above it as it moves. And that's what they're trying to show in this animation. The arrows show the motion. And one of the really cool things about this is they show that the mantle is being pushed upward with these arrows underneath Virginia. And again, even in recent times. And that would explain, that's a way to generate volcanic eruptions. It's a way to make the mantle melt here. It's a way to explain why Virginia seems to be pushing up for no other reason than it is. Okay? It's because literally everything is kind of being pushed up above the slab as it's sinking. And um, maybe, I don't know if it has anything directly to do with the earthquakes or not. Um, now this can't explain everything because according to this, this should be happening. And there should be volcanoes um, all along the east coast, right? <laughs> um, that explains it. So there's something else special going on in Virginia. But the bottom line here is that if you start thinking at all scales, and I, I've touched on this a little bit, geologists think about huge time scales compared to our own, compared to our own time scale. And we have to think about 
spatial scales, including the whole Earth, and really deep into the Earth, 1,100 kilometers, 800 kilometers underneath us, to get a big picture of what's going on. And sometimes, to get that big picture, help understand it, you have to look really, really small at these little crystals in the rocks to get some of your evidence uh, for understanding stuff. So, again, the bottom line here is hopefully, um, from this talk, you have some idea of why these things are interesting, geologically speaking. Um, they tie in to the big picture of what's gone on over hundreds of million years here. Uh, but they're kind of mysterious because we don't know why they occurred. Um, but one of the interesting things, and we've only started looking at this, is we can go to all these things and look for the chunks of stuff that they brought up to the surface and uh, get a better picture of what's going on under the East Coast, not just Virginia, um, from these things. Um, and hopefully, by doing other analyses, including a lot of chemical analyses that I didn't talk about today, you can get some clues as to where the basalt is coming from and why the volcanic eruptions might have been happening, which is one of the big pictures we really want to understand. So, I want to stop here and let people ask questions or run away if you're done. Um, but you're welcome to stay, and if you didn't get a chance to see the rocks, please come back down and I'll be happy to talk to you about them. Okay, thanks.
as the magma cools, it records the Earth's magnetic field, and the Earth's magnetic field changes through time. So if you have that record of that key, then you can kind of match your rock. And so those are the two ways that they do these kind of rocks, mostly. Um, some other ways just don't work. Yeah, back there. Would it be accurate to think of the, um, the Farallon plate uh, plunging under North America as saying like, out of, like a bow wave of a ship? And that bow wave should then rippled across North America that's now under Virginia. Yeah, um, so he's asking about, I guess, kind of how the Farallon plate or that subducting, sinking ship um, changes through time. And that you, know, you have kind of like a wake coming through. In the front. Yeah, in the front. Um, I don't know how much the leading edge affects things. I really don't. I don't know if they can model that and show anything. But the plate does move, and it moves closer to us through time, even the middle part of it. You can kind of see that on the animation. And that does change where things are being uplifted through time. So the uplift kind of moves from west to east. Would you think maybe you would find a chain of volcanoes across North America as that plate went under? You know, it would then yep. have influenced. But of course, the Mississippi Valley is there probably yep. destroyed uh, The other place where they have evidence that the Farallon plate influenced volcanism is actually in the basin and range um, in Nevada. And it was one of the first places that this funky subducting plate kind of had an influence on it. So yeah. Yes. When were the eruptions the least at their peak? At their peak? That's a really good question. So he's asking basically when were the most eruptions yeah, during like that time? When were they, when were they more I can't answer that because we don't have enough data. We only have about 10 ages, and they just seem to be spread for that whole period of time kind of evenly. And so to answer your question, what we need to do is collect more of these rocks and get dates for all of them so we can test that. Is there some time, like 40 million years ago, when a lot of them erupted, and then only like one erupted 35 million years ago? So that's a very good question, but we can't answer that right now. Let me get somebody in the back. Yeah. What do you think the next eruption would be? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay, so the USGS classification of um, dormant or extinct volcanoes generally go back, you know, tens of thousands of years. So 48 million years ago, I think they're extinct. Um, and I would never say anything otherwise. <laughs> the only reason that you'd say differently is if we start getting certain kinds of earthquakes that are not the kind that we had in August, but they, they're, they're, they actually look very different on a seismometer that indicate that magma is moving through the crust. That motion of magma moving through the crust looks very differently than the crust breaking and fracturing like the one in August. And we have time for one more question. Oh, I'm trying to get somebody different, so I'll answer yes. Why are the feldspars and snails different, like more rare? They're rare because they don't make up. So she's asking why are the minerals feldspar and spinel um, rare or different? And it's because most of the mantle is made of that mineral olivine and the mineral pyroxene, the two other two. Um, and so those other two minerals, they have lots of aluminum the element aluminum in them, and there's just not that much aluminum in the mantle. So they only form when you have that aluminum. And it depends on the deeper you go, you change that mineral that holds the aluminum. Okay, That's and why. I have another part. Um, why, what are the gray rocks in the studio? I know there's a lot of sleep. Is sleep something that came from um, a basalt? Oh, what other rocks are in the Shenandoah Valley? Like, did sleep come from basalt? Is it uh, uh, slates uh, come from uh, clays, kind of eroding, and so no, they wouldn't come directly from the salts. Uh, most of the rocks where I live are sedimentary rocks that form from weathering of other rocks and deposited, which is why these are so weird too. I mean, we're just we're in a sea of carbonate or kind of calcium carbonate rocks there, and then there's these things. So. And I know that there are other questions, but we're out of time. If we can thank our speaker, please.